Hello, everyone, and welcome to season two of The Real Influencers Project. I'm your host, Craig Reynolds, and with me today is someone that has graced the sidelines for the NCAA March Madness Tournament, um, NCAA football games, the NFL, the current host of Race Hub on Fox Sports 1, and triathlete and has run in some of the most iconic marathon events in the United States, Shannon Spade. You forgot What's, close friend of Craig Reynolds. Oh, well, you know, I, yes. And, you know, we've been friends for a very long time and I'm very fortunate to know her for sure. So thank mm -hmm. you for coming on, Shannon. This is so, so special for you to be here considering our relationship and um, the time that I got to work with you back at Speed and seeing our families grow and where we are now. It's such a cool thing to, to be able to sit here and chat with you about something totally different. It all started at Speed, Craig. That was my first on-air gig. That was the first, I mean, I was green. I worked my tail off as did all of us. I met you and Vicky and our relationships are still very strong. And uh, it was a crazy time because I feel like none of us really knew what we were doing. And we were, we were, we were led by, by a guy that was even <laughs> crazier, but, uh, but I mean, we, we came together for a reason and uh, it was, it was fate, you know? Yeah, I completely agree. And it's, it's so cool. The, the way that the relationships that we built and, and bonded and are still there and how yeah. strong they became. Like, it's really, really neat and special because I don't think a lot of people get that. Yeah, it's been like almost 20 years, right? Because it was 2005, I think, 2006, maybe, 2005. I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah, six. I think it was six, maybe six, whatever yeah. in that area. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh that is so long. It's, yeah, it's been a while. It's like, it's crazy because... I did an event recently where, and every time I do an event and they, they run down my, my resume, I, I feel like for so long, you spend the first half of your career pretending like you're supposed to be there and pretending like, you know, what you're doing and, and, and making sure that no one finds out that you're the fraud <laughs> that you're, you know, that you feel like you are for, for not really knowing what you're doing and, and how you're doing it. And then you get to a point where you look back and you're like, Holy, mo I, I well, Oh, okay. I'm old, <laughs> you right. know? Right. So it's uh yeah, but it all started at Speed Channel and it all started with uh NASCAR Nation. Oh my god, that was <laughs> a special time. That was a really really for so many reasons for me, that time was really special. And I really leaned on that crew um just because there's a lot going on. And yeah. I think that's part of the reason why um we all grew so tight together and why we still remain friends and like when Vicky's like oh yeah Shannon and, Jer and Jerry came out and I'm like ah, I want to come out too <laughs> yeah. we need to have like a reunion of sorts yeah and like it's starting the next generation because her daughter and my my boys are like in love and yes uh, <laughs> I hear about that yes <laughs> and they're constantly <laughs> like playing Roblox together or Robux and um on Adopt Me and and on all these games where they have like the chat and Bailey's calling and and so yeah it's uh it's 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 definitely filtering over to the next generation I love it that, that is so cool and then some one day we'll get Max involved in there and Absolutely. yeah they can all pal around because that, that little knucklehead holy Moses we got to get him out there this summer because uh, we just actually bought a ski boat so that the boys can start like really oh, hurting themselves. Really cool. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 I mean, that's, this, this is the time frame where you start yeah. to get broke off. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. They have dirt bikes now. And, um, and so, yeah, we'll have to get you guys out on the lake this summer. Once, once that it stops be, raining yeah, and the, and the, you know, the freezing cold weather stops. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's on its way and it's real quickly on its way. So let's talk about your career. You said the first show was NASCAR nation. You grew up in South Florida. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Miami Dolphins fan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Miami Dolphins fan, mostly not anymore. I've had to give them up just because it's so painful year after year. <laughs> so I kind of go through that. Plus, I, I don't know, like working in the NFL, I, I don't have the time or the energy to watch other games except the ones that I'm preparing for. So right. I just don't have, and even when I covered the Dolphins, it was really nostalgic to me. Like I, I, I've put this out on uh, social media before that, you know, I was this knucklehead, you know, 21 year old in college with their friends at like the top seat, you know, the top seat, drinking beer, walking in, watching Jason Taylor or Zach Thomas play on the field. And then all of a sudden here I am on the field of this place that, you know, really was, um, you know, part of sort of my, my childhood. Yeah. And uh, I got to interview Jason Taylor right after he 
it was inducted into the hall of fame and he got his ring. We just happened to do that game. It's so crazy that you, you think about like moments in your life and, and, and events that you get to do that are just sort of full circle. And that was really cool. And I said to him right before I did the interview, I said, I got to tell you, Jason. And I told him the story about me sitting up there. And I said, this is not just because I get to interview you, but for me to interview you because of how much sort of has changed in my life. Because growing up in Fort Lauderdale, it, it's um, it's a great place to go visit. It's a tough place to grow up there. Uh, and, and plus, it was the it was you know the '90s. I was raised by a single mom who worked three jobs. We did not have um, we we were not well off. We, you know, we didn't, we couldn't run air conditioning. We couldn't run heater. Uh, and it was a tough time. We, we basically raised ourselves. And when you're a kid, 15, 16, 17 years old, raising yourself and you don't have any parental guidance, you don't have a, you don't have a, a, a path or no one is telling you what you should or shouldn't do. So it was a really, it was a tough, tough time in my, in my teens and my childhood in, in Florida. And then one day I kind of, I don't know, I, I just woke up and I realized that I, I had to get out of there. And that was when I really kind of buckled down, got my degree and moved to New York city. When I, like, I was literally in the U-Haul truck, like a month after I graduated, uh, walked across that stage at Florida Atlantic university, just because I knew that I needed to go somewhere where I could find myself and find what I wanted to do with my life. What did you do when you got to New York city? So I moved there with a buddy and we didn't have, uh, we had, I think we had an apartment. It was like, we had found it. Maybe we had gone up once before and found it. It seems like a lifetime ago. It was 1990, 2000, it was 2000. So it was 21 years ago. And uh, we didn't have a bed. We didn't have pretty much anything. We had sold our cars, you know, in because we didn't need one in-, in You need a car there. Yeah. And we moved to Queens. <laughs> Queens! I just finished <laughs> watching Coming to America. And <laughs> so we moved to Astoria, Queens and- it was such a cool time in my life. Uh, I loved living in Astoria. I, I literally hit the ground running. I printed up resumes when we used to print resumes. I knew that I wanted to work at 1515 Broadway because back in the 90s, TRL Live was the hottest thing. And I went to Times Square one time before I moved there and being in Times Square and being outside that building, the energy of all those kids out there. Remember, they'd be like screaming, Britney Spears yes. was in there. Uh -huh. And it was just like, oh my, this is, this is where I have to be. Yeah. And yeah. I found out that they released a job posting every two weeks inside the, the Viacom building, which is 1515 Broadway. And so I just rode the elevators and I handed out resumes and I sent my resume into every single position. I mean, director of finance, you know, I, stuff that I was not qualified for. But I just thought to myself, if, if someone sees my resume enough, then maybe it'll just kind of be one of those things that this, this girl keeps sending in a resume. She's not qualified for this, but maybe for this. And yes. within two and a half weeks, I had a job offer at 1515 Broadway at Nickelodeon in the building. And so I, I started working there and it was so cool. Like, you know, riding the train to, to work every day and, and being there. Uh, I went from Nickelodeon. Uh, there was an, again, there was an internal posting and CBS at the time was part of Viacom. So I moved over to work at CBS uh, specifically on the early show at the time it was Brian Gumbel mm -hmm. and Jake Clayson. So I was sure. doing, I was doing, you know, on air promos, not on air. I wasn't on air, but I was producing them basically like when you see your morning news, a uh, local news, if one of the anchors from the national uh, show pops into your local news and says, Hey, coming up on the morning show or good GMA, we're going to be doing this. I produced those. So I would be in contact with the affiliate and, and then, um, and then our talent that was, that was in New York. So I did that. And, and then I, uh, you know, September 11th happened during that time, which was working for the news on September 11th and, and everything that sort of, we experienced not only as a country, but certainly in New York city, right. uh, changed me and, and gave me, um, if it does, if it didn't change you, there's something wrong. If you didn't look at that event and sort of try to think about what it was, especially having it be so close and seeing the missing signs and seeing the family members looking for their loved ones. If that constant reminder of your mortality and, and things 
that you want out of your life, if you don't kind of reflect on that, there's, there's something seriously wrong. You know, I think there's something wrong with you if you don't do that. And you, no matter where you lived or grew up and Amen. when that happened, like, I still remember I was still in Chicago at that time, waiting to get on an airplane the next week to go to Philadelphia, I think for a race. And there was no airplanes flying anymore. Like over my house, I'd look at like, this is the quietest I've ever seen. This is so surreal and bizarre. Yeah. I can remember like it was yesterday because it was that impactful. Yeah. Kind of like what we went through last year with the pandemic, same kind of thing, you know, it's just, Still. I mean, obviously very different. I mean, it would, the, you know, it, it, a lot of, a lot of people have lost their lives, but it, yeah, it was, it was that sort of like, there's no airplanes, there's no cars. Everyone kind of stopped. Everyone knew what everybody was thinking. That was one thing that I took from that time. I would get on a bus in New York city or train or whatever. And you'd look around and normally like when you're around all those people in New York, you're sort of in your own little bubble. And it was the first time that you looked to the left or the right and you knew what everybody on that, on that bus or that train was thinking. It was, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting time. So let's go back to, to growing up in Florida. You moved to New York, worked a couple of the different TV jobs, but it seems like you mentioned a little bit ago about full circle sports came back around into your life. Were you using sports as a youngster, as a, as like a, an escape? To well, a I was a swimmer, right? So my dad was go. a swimmer. I know I wasn't great, but it was, it was the one thing that gave me structure in my life. The one thing, the one thing that was sort of my, and, I, and I've, I've found triathlon now and I just oh, we're it. so getting to that. Don't yeah. you worry. We're so getting to that. It's sort of my lighthouse. And that's kind of how I've described triathlon in the past. And I, and I strongly believe if I didn't have uh, swimming back in the day, it, it, my life would have been very different. That's what made me really sad about this last year with kids not being able to compete in sports because of the pandemic, because I do feel 100% that they're so vital in, in kids' lives. Absolutely. Um, us with a swimming background of fitness there yeah that you're always gonna have like I know a lot of people that were swimmers that raced bikes that had this fitness base that was out of this world um Hmm. after all the years of not swimming and going and doing tv and branching off into that and we're gonna bounce around a little bit um got on the bike and started riding and started swimming again did you ever stop swimming was there a time when you were like I'm done with this yeah yeah. And I hate it now. Like I, I, I like, I have to get in the pool today and swim 750 yards. Plus my training, I've gotten involved with this virtual Ironman race. So, um, I have to do these distances every single week, but I, I hate it. And, and I hate, like, I, I stand there and I just think, Oh God, what am I doing? Go home. Why are you here? And then you get in and, and yeah, it kind of comes back to you. I was never a cyclist. I ne- literally, I bought my first like road bike when I decided that I wanted to do triathlons and I spent like, I, I mean, I bought like the heavy, it was heavy. It was, it was awful. And I was like, if I like it, I'll buy another one. And then I bought another one and then I got another one. Uh, but I'm not a great cyclist. I I'm a good swimmer because I have the background, but I'm not, I'm not fast. Um, I can get in there and swim, but I, uh, I, yeah, I have a good base, I guess I should say. And I'm a pretty strong runner. I'm consistent on the run. So when I start out at nine minute miles or eight minute, eight fifty, I finish at eight fifty. where other people just, you know, kind of start to fall off. I'm pretty consistent with the run the entire time. That's pretty incredible. You, when you're doing those as well, I noticed that you have a charity or that you do the runs for a charity and you have donations come in. How fantastic is that? And that's got to feel great. It's um, being part of the Ironman Foundation. I've I've told people before, doing the actual physical activity is the part that allows me to be part of the foundation and allows me to meet some of the people that I've met. So I have some friends, Brent and Kyle Peace. Uh, They're they're brothers. One of the brothers is, is quadriplegic. He's in a wheelchair. So his brother pulls him during the swim, races with him, runs with him. And I'm like, if that is not the most selfless, Thing because I like I go out I won't even take my dog out on a run because it's it, I just want to go and and I and it's I don't want to have to go through the process of getting something else ready to go out right. and you think about what these two brothers do together they've raced Kona and and there's also uh, the the Agars a father son duo that does that as well um, Mike Ergo is a very good friend of mine he's a Marine he lost like 27 of his brothers in Fallujah. 
And he started the gold star program at Ironman foundation. So he runs the entire run portion, whether it be 13.1 or 26.2 with a huge American flag. And I'm talking like on a flagpole, he runs the entire thing and then gives that flag to a gold star family when he crosses the finish line. So it's like, you, you go like, I'm worried that my calf hurts today or that like my, my triceps are sore. And you think about these beautiful human beings that I've been able to meet that fill my cup. And so the physical activity of doing all of that stuff is what gets me to be part of this foundation and raise money and and to meet these beautiful people. How did you get involved with them in the first place? They called me. They they knew that I was interested in doing triathlon. Uh, I had first been hooked up with Ironman. Uh, so they, they, Iron Man reached out to me and heard that I was interested in doing triathlon. So I did one with them. And then the next year they called me and asked me if I wanted to be an ambassador. I've raised probably maybe $65,000 for the Iron Man foundation. So- and again, all through my, my, my athlete friends, my coaches, all of that stuff. I reach out to them. I get signed basketballs, footballs, shoes, gloves, helmets, whatever. And I auction those off. And so I'm providing something for these race fans and and these, and these sports fans. And also obviously everything's going to charity. So it's, it's a full-time job though. When I do that, when I do that, um, that auction, it's about two weeks, my friends that work on the radio, they, they have me on to promote the auction. Uh, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's definitely worth it. Excellent. And when, before we end this, I want to know when people can uh, expect for the next one so they can get involved. With, uh, yeah, April or May, I think I'm going to do it. Oh, cool. Excellent. Even better. Yeah, I've already started pulling some stuff together. It's not going to be as big as it, as it has been in past years uh, because, you know, just it's hard with the pandemic. Mm-hmm. I've been able to get like a flag signed by all the drivers in past years. I think I'm going to get something from Jimmy. Um, I've already kind of put in a request for that. Uh, I think I'm going to get I'm going to get a piece of sheet metal from Chase Elliott, which which made me made the foundation about a thousand dollars two years ago. I found as when I was moving, I found the Dale Jr. ESPN, the magazine. I don't know if you remember that back in like 08, Marty Smith wrote the article. And so I still had the magazine. So I reached out to juniors people and I was like, wouldn't junior mind autographing this so that I can auction it off. Sure. No problem. So I have that, which oh, anything, so. anything Dale jr. Goes for, you know, a good little penny. Right. Uh, so I've already started kind of putting together some stuff and, and thinking ahead. That is fantastic. So let's go back to TV. You're in New York. You're obviously laying a really nice groundwork there. How did you get to Charlotte? So when September 11th happened and, and I, I realized that I was not a New Yorker and <laughs> realized that I wanted more out of life. New York is great. It was a very fast pace. Time is totally different. I was working, I was building a resume, but I didn't have that sort of personal balance. Mm. My family, my, my sister, my mom, and a couple of aunts and uncles had moved to Charlotte. And so I, you know, I was like, I'm going to go down there. And it was really humbling because I went from living on my own and working in New York and having a great job to living on my uncle's couch and being on unemployment and uh, paying my dad for a car that I was like basically leasing from him because I had to start all over again. I remember I went back, I had waited tables for about eight years in high school and college. And I went back and waited tables and it was a really, it was a hard time for me. Cause you wonder like, did I do the right thing? I was trying desperately to get out of television. I was somehow, I was fascinated by uh, being involved in, in racing in terms of PR I interviewed to be a couple of PR, like I interviewed to be Kurt Busch's PR girl. I interviewed to be Jimmy Johnson's PR girl uh, and, and things just didn't work out and it didn't work out because now I obviously know. And I think that's what I tell young kids nowadays, just chill. It, it, this might not happen, but it's, it's for a reason. And I'm an example of that. If I had gotten any one of those jobs, I wouldn't be where I was today. Right. And it's, such huge insight for yourself to be able to look back and go, wow, that didn't happen, but this is why there's 100%. always a reason. And it's so hard to, sometimes it's really hard to accept that sometimes when you're like, I want that so bad, but it doesn't happen. You're like, well, I guess I should just wait and relax and see what happens. Like when you're in high school and you're like, why doesn't he love me? And then, <laughs> like, and then you realize well, that's probably a good thing that he didn't love you because God. Right, totally. <laughs> it worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you're starting out in NASCAR, you get to speed and then you go to ESPN and then you're branched out and you're doing all kinds of other sports and sideline reporting. And 
How do you feel that the start at speed made that transition easier or more challenging or more exciting for you? Um, the transition from speed to ESPN? Yes, yes. So from going from race cars to stick and ball. Well, it took me a while to get into the stick and ball. So I got hired at ESPN because I had some sort of NASCAR, even though I knew, I mean, NASCAR nation wasn't exactly like we're talking <laughs> track bar lifestyle. adjustments or anything like that. Total, it was total lifestyle. This, and that was, was, that's the shit I like. I want to hear about someone's lifestyle in the background. I don't care about all the other crap. Everyone knows that stuff. Fluff. It was right? fun. Right. But yeah. That's just yeah. fun. So my first sort of like, oh crap moment was when muscles came and said, we're going to put you and Marty Smith on a show together. It's going to be sort of like PTI. He said, she said. And I was like, muscles, I don't know anything about NASCAR. <laughs> like I've been doing sponsor appearances for whatever, six or seven months. So I locked myself in my house and it was before sort of all this crazy internet. And I, I, I locked myself in my house for like two weeks and just notes after notes, after notes, after notes and approached Marty Smith one day in the Indianapolis uh, Motor Speedway P uh, media center. And I said to him at, flat out, I said, Hey, listen, I know you're going to take a chance you have a reputation, you know, you, you know, this sport, you're taking a chance by doing a show with someone who obviously doesn't. I said, I promise you what I don't know, I will make up for in preparation. And he could have buried me so many times on that show. It buried me. Right. And, but he, he respected that I worked hard. We're still very, very close. Uh, we worked together for a very long time when we both went over to ESPN covering NASCAR. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I give Marty a lot of credit for where I am because sort of coming into NASCAR, not having friends or not knowing anybody, he introduced me to a lot of people and I got cred through him. And that really helped set, set the foundation. So that backseat driver show that we did, that was what sort of helped kind of bridge to ESPN. And then when I got to ESPN, like, I didn't know what I was doing, Craig. I remember it took me an hour to read four tracks for a VO piece, an hour, because I had no, like, I had no experience. I was so green, but. A yeah, but you had talent and, you, and, and that was obvious from the beginning that, and, and you have drive and work ethic. You combine those two things, just those two alone, and you can do anything you want to do. Well, I, I mean, hard work is certainly the, sort of the foundation of, of my entire career because there's been a million times still to this day that there are people that are better than me, people that probably uh, have uh, a better, uh, more, more contacts, more this, more that, but I'm going to bust my tail. Right. I am going to bust my tail and I will never be accused of not showing up to a meeting prepared or not being 100% prepared. I was just um, doing a, a, a group last night uh, of, of women. It's a women's group here in Charlotte. And I, I told them, I said, hard work is genderless. That's a motto of mine. I'm going to have that written on my tombstone. I don't care you know, what you look like. If you work hard, I think that the respect is going to come. And I, I do think that that has a, I'm proof of that as well. Cause I have not been, I have not been the number one choice in a lot of, in a lot of uh, circumstances, but I've, I'll work my tail off. But you know, when the, one of the things that I love about you is that you're genuine though. And I think that goes a long way as well, because as long as I've known you, you've been the same Shannon, Appreciate whether that. you're on set or you're doing this with me, or I see you over at Brookdale at Starbucks. I get, you're the same person all the time. And to me, that's great. And I think that speaks to your confidence level in preparation because you can be yourself and not be some fake person that when you meet him in the street, you're like, oh, that was a bummer. I appreciate that. When I was uh, working at Outback Steakhouse, when I was probably oh, 19 or 20, maybe 18, 19, 20, something like that. I had a, a really good friend who was a waitress there and, and she was she was attractive, but I wouldn't say that she was, you know, I mean, she had a girlfriend. So I'll use this comparison. She had a girlfriend who looked just like Pamela Anderson. And like back then that was like the top, right? I mean, Pam Anderson was like, everybody wanted to look like Pam Anderson. <laughs> and this girl who looked like Pam Anderson wasn't very nice. I remember she just wasn't a really nice person. And I remember sort of this switch. I, I, like, I remember all of a sudden looking at this beautiful blonde 
thin, hot woman all of a sudden wasn't as pretty. And all of a sudden the shift to my friend who certainly didn't have all of those attributes. And all of a sudden I realized she was beautiful. Right. And I remember that I remember, like, I just remember that happening. And I just remember thinking, finally realizing that this whole, whatever's on the outside does not matter. It is what is inside that counts and in your authentic authenticity and your passion and your realness. And uh, so I, I thank you because I, I've tried to kind of bring that through my entire life. Oh, no, it's without a doubt. That's you. When Thanks. I see you, I'm like, oh, that's Shannon. That's, <laughs> that's the quirky, fun, light Shannon that I've known from day one. And that was when we met on NASCAR Nation. The first thing I was like, she's fun. Like oh. she's the absolute blast the whole time. <laughs> Um, and I appreciate that because I, you can see when someone's just trying to be someone else when they're doing their job. It's like, why don't you just be yourself? Like, that's plenty. If it's not enough, that's someone else's problem. Being you is always enough. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Again, I try to teach my kids that. My son, <clears throat> uh, I remember when he was like eight or nine, he wanted unicorns and like he wanted a, like a like unicorn pajamas and then a unicorn. And I took a picture of him on Christmas morning. Cause we got it for him. And I was like, it took me 30 years to realize who I was and to be comfortable in my own skin. And my 10 year old or my nine year old has it already. And I've told him that story. Like, I'm like, Liam, you don't care. You don't, you don't care if you're wearing pink from head to toe and you're going to walk into school and maybe one of the other boys will be like, you're not supposed to wear pink. And he's like, yes, I am. I just, I think that that is so awesome that, um, that I see that. And I, I really hope that they keep that. We nurture that in Maxwell too. Like be yourself. And that, that kid will roll out with all kinds of wild looking gear on. He doesn't give <laughs> yeah. a shit. He's like, this is what I'm wearing. Awesome. I like it. Like that's right. You know awesome. You yeah. Right. Don't you wish that we had had that when we were younger? Like oh. I tried my whole life to be to fit in, to be part of this group or to be part of this group, not really knowing who Shannon was. Uh, New York taught me that a lot because people in New York just don't have time for, like, they don't care. Like, we don't have to like each other. We can sit right next to each other all day long at work. I don't have to like you, but we're going to have to work together. Right. Whereas like, you know, growing up in Florida, it was like people would be fake just to like make people like you. And New York taught me just be yourself. Not everyone's going to like you and it doesn't matter. Just be yourself. Can be exhaust it would be, it's got to be exhausting to live that style of that yeah. life where you don't where you're trying to live for someone else that's yeah. that. I hate yeah that. amen um so what's next for shannon's faith what do you where, where, where are your plans where are you going i'm pretty happy right now we were just talking um you know we we've it's work is not as intense uh, it's because of the pandemic we're doing the show race hub as a one host instead of two hosts and ever since the beginning of my, when I started to try to make the move from NASCAR to, to stick and ball sports, I would work the entire off season doing basketball. I would, I would go to the racetrack Friday through Monday and then do a hoops game on Tuesday. So I've had this rapid pace. I had a couple of years off when I stopped covering NASCAR between, I would say 13 and 16, mm -hmm. which was really nice because my kids were three to six where I would only work September to April. And then I would have April to September off. And it was those three years. And I remember I was like, I'm gonna write a book. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna be so busy. I'm gonna be productive. And it would get to the end of sort of my off time. And I'd be like, I did nothing. And I remember one day. Yeah, but you were a mom though. There's a difference. Amen. So I'm just gonna- the gnarliest job ever, I, no doubt. So I was walking my kids one day back from, from the gym. Cause I used to run them up to the gym and, and, and run back. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm looking at like a Twitter thing or something. And I'm like, oh my God, people are being so productive. I haven't done anything. I need to start doing something. And it was at that moment that one of my kids sort of leaned up over the, the stroller and was like, mommy, mommy. And I was like, I have done something. I have done the most important thing. I have been present for my children. I have taken them to the park. I have done this. I have done that. And um, yeah, so that, again, that perspective is not lost on me. Yes, then that's the book okay. can wait till they're in college. <laughs> you know what? There's plenty of time to write a book. And by the yeah. time you write it, you're gonna even have more stuff. Oh, do it, right? I, I don't know. It's pretty, it's pretty front loaded. <laughs> it's pretty front loaded. <laughs> well, like I said, it'll like you said, it'll all come full circle. And I'm sure it'll all tie in really well. 
Yeah. So that's it. You know, we're doing race hub and, and then I'm hosting the pre-race show right now, uh, which is a dream come true. I really love doing that show with Jamie and Larry. That was sort of my next move. I love sideline reporting and I love doing that, but I wanted to do more than just 30 second reports. And um, I really feel like Ra race hub and, and, you know, race day has given me that, that opportunity. I, I thought to myself, like I've, I've been in, you know, uh, locker rooms with John Calipari or, or coach K or, you know, I've been, I've done this and I've done that. And I have nowhere to sort of have that outlet kind of come out and tell some of those stories. And while I don't really get to do it a whole lot on, on race hub, I do feel like it allows my creativity of what I've kind of experienced over the years and grown. And, and so it is, it's a lot of fun. And then I just love doing the NFL, those athletes being down there with those guys and, and seeing their, just how elite they are oh, from right. an athletic standpoint. Right. It just blows my mind. I don't know how people that big can move that fast, like from zero they're, to a hundred so fast and they're massive. I, I'll be at practice and you'll see them run and you're just like, oh, like they just look beautiful. You know, Christian right. McCaffrey just posted a, 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 a video on his Instagram. I think it was where he was doing sort of like just sprints and he, they took it in a slow motion and it's, I mean, it's like someone drew him doing this. I don't look like that. You know, <laughs> my legs are like, like this and, you know, and so, yeah, it's, it's incredible. And then you just see the way that they jump and, and everything about them. Uh, DK Metcalf, I, I, for the first, I saw him for the first time and I was like, he, he had his shirt kind of pulled up. I was like, he has more muscles. In, in the back, like in his back, in his, I was like, who, who made this human being? Right. Someone like you are blessed. <laughs> I mean, right. just right. incredible. It is so cool. Lots of, lots of God-given talent there for sure. Add on some work ethic. Boom. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a lot of fun. So that's what I'm doing right now. And, and um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm really happy doing, I'm training for Kona. So that'll start to take some time. Uh, I, I haven't done a full Ironman yet. I trained for Ironman Florida in 2017, two weeks before the event, a hurricane hit the area. And so it was canceled. So I went out and did the New York city marathon that same weekend and, and just had a blast, but, um, it'll be my second time training for a full Ironman. And, and it was not pretty the first time there were a lot of dark places that I went to emotionally and physically. So I'm kind of preparing myself for that journey again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, the mental aspect of sports, is, yeah. I don't think it's enough credit as well. That's, yeah. Spending that's... seven hours on a bike. <sighs> I'm good. Yeah. Thanks. It's hard. That's, that's, yeah, that's pretty gnarly. I've been there. Well, not seven hours direct, but enough, right? Yeah. There's what's the longest? Saddle, I'm good. What's the longest? Like you're, I mean, obviously you're not in, you're not an endurance person. No, I was you're a sprinter. Yeah. Me and my spikes was a sprint. So I, you know, we were there all day for four days. When I mean all day, I mean, you know, 6 a.m. Some of these big races don't end until 1 a.m. They could be back the next day at six to race again. So um, just the physical toll of being there and the mental toll of, you know, going down after the, after your lap and then trying to get back up. Um, and it all stems from the training, you know, as well as I do, you got to put the work in before you get there. Otherwise you're going to be shit. I feel like the sprints are harder than the endurance because the endurance, you don't have to, it's a physical challenge, but it's more of a mental challenge because you could do something for 17 hours. I, I can go out and I could walk all day for 15 hours. Right. I mean, if you're just walking, right but, but what are your, what is your mind doing? Whereas that those sprint distances for me, like you're also pushing yourself as like, you're pushing yourself to the physical limit because it's a sprint. And so it's like, you have to go faster and faster and faster. I, I find the sprint distance to be really challenging. My favorite is a 70.3. I feel like it's a great combination. You can kind of push yourself at times, but not be too hard on yourself. That's pretty incredible. Even to think yeah. to me, I'm like 70.3. Oh my God. <laughs> just the swim part where I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. I don't uh, swim like a brick. So I'm all right. Um, the swim, <laughs> the swim is really interesting. I, I've, I've full disclosure. I've, I've started to hyperventilate every single swim that I've done in my, yeah, I have to turn over on my back and just kind of like relax. Once I put my head in that water and you can't see anything, 
it really messes with me. Cause it's one thing to be in a swimming pool with lane lines and you can see right. the bottom when you get in those lakes and there's nothing around you. And you're like, there's a dead body. There's a snake. <laughs> there's a shark. And you're like, you know, like, you're like, I, I, what, what was that? And, and so, yeah, I mean, your mind just starts messing with you and then there's people swimming over you and it's, um, it's a lot of fun. I was going to say that. What's it like when you're, and then I'll let you get out of here. Um, Cause I know you got to go swim. What is it like when you're in the water and you're swimming and there's all these people, there's feet in your face and it's like, it's like a fight. It's crazy. Yeah. I am so jealous of people who could get in those open water swims and look so peaceful. And every time I see them, like, I'm like, God, they look so like, they're just like out for a, a stroll. I am my, everything is just going crazy. And then when you get in, they they've done the rolling starts, which at, at Ironman, which is definitely better. So it starts with two people at a time, instead of just this mass sort of like right. entire age groupers going at once. And the rolling starts been a lot better. Those mass entries are crazy. Cause you're like, I want to start over here. Cause I don't, then I'm going to get kicked. And then you end up getting funneled. I've been kicked in the face. I've been kicked in the stomach. I've been like, literally someone swam right over me one time. And what are you going to do? You know, like, what are you going to do? Right. You know, they're, they're trying to survive just as much as you are. And so, Amazing. you know, just pray you get to the end. You have to, it's, 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 oh, I get out every time and I'm like, thank God. I thank God I didn't die. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, you're going to be on one of those NBC um, triathlon shows where they show the race, but they also profile the people and I thought, that'd be so fun. inspirational and so cool. I'm like, oh my God, I want to, I want to be a part of that. That's really neat. I don't want to do a triathlon, but I want to be a part of that whole story of that person. Yeah. The stories are the best and you got yeah the iron man foundation has been really good to me they'll follow me with a camera just to kind of get some video for a race hub or whatever and last year they sent me all the video that they had shot of me like in transition and you know when you go from the pool to the bike or the bike to the swim uh to right. the run and i was able to send it to my family and friends because they, they don't get to see that part of it they don't get to see you putting on your shoes or changing your outfit or doing whatever and, and kind of the process inside there of what you go through. They see you as you're getting ready to go out on the bike or, you know, just as you're pulling out. And so it was really kind of cool to see that. And it was cool for me to kind of relive that part of the triathlon. And that's a pretty gnarly part of the, of the event or the, yeah. of the race as well as that transition. That's important. My first triathlons, I would get out of the, and I would brush my hair and I'd be brushing my hair. And, and like a buddy looked at me and he was like, what, what are you doing? Like, what do you, I'm like, pictures last forever. My friend pictures last forever. I don't brush my hair anymore, but the first couple triathlons I did, I, I have to admit, I, I, I was not panicked and trying to get through that transition very quickly. That is hilarious. So <laughs> when uh, you do get your, your foundation going again, then the donations, where can people get a hold of you so they can uh, be a part of it? Yeah. So it'll be on eBay. So I have a, it's like an eBay, uh, backslash spakers. I think it, it is. Uh, I have my own eBay page and I'll put that out on social media. Once I start to, to, to raise some money and, and have some of those things out there. I have a Larry Fitzgerald signed Jersey oh, I'm gonna cool. put on there. Yeah. I have, um, uh, Jonathan Vilma signed both a uh, new Orleans saints football and the Miami hurricanes football for me. Chris Spielman signed a football for me. So I don't have as much as I've had in the past. I'm kind of looking over here because I have my, my bin of all my stuff, but it, it'll be, it'll be some stuff that I can, that I can certainly make some money for the foundation for. Very nice. And what's the social media handle? Uh, well, I'm Shannon Spake on Instagram and I think I'm Shannon Spake on Twitter as well. That so makes think, sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think that, I think I'm on both Shannon Spake. So yeah. Yeah. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to let you go so you can go jump in the pool. I know. Uh, it has been a thank pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate been, that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, been <laughs> go. Um, it's been far too long since I've seen you. So it's, uh, it's such a, a pleasure. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for finally having me on season two. Um, well, we'll have you on more, right? We'll, we'll okay. do more than once a, once a season. So if you guys like what you're seeing, please make sure that you subscribe here on YouTube and on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys soon. Shannon, be good. I'll talk to you later.